We're gonna to talk to you today about diversity and inclusion, some of the challenges that we face when we are trying to build a more diverse workforce. But before I start, I actually wanna tell a personal story. I have a confession to make. I'm an avid science fiction reader. I've been an avid science fiction reader since I was eight years old. When my stepfather, he made me an offer that I couldn't refuse. He said, I will buy you another of those Nancy Drew mysteries that you read every week. Or I will give you these four collected science fiction novels. Which one do you choose? Well, four, I couldn't resist four books. And so I took those books and I began reading science fiction. It actually sparked for me a lifelong love of science fiction. And when I reached about 16, one of the things that I realized about those novels, those visions of the future that I so enjoyed, was that none of those authors weren't envisioning a future that included people that looked like me. So fast forward a number of years, I have a career as a professor, I discover tech. And so all this time I've been reading about people who were imagining the future, but I suddenly had the opportunity to work with people who were actually building the future. And I asked the question, what type of future do we want to build? Do we want to build a future for everyone? Do we want to build a future for a diverse and global world? I think we have an opportunity here. In fact, we have a great power, and with that great power comes great responsibility. Any comics fans here? That's right, Spider-Man. That responsibility is to unlock the diversity that we all share. So I want to talk a little bit about what I mean when I say diversity. And there are two types of diversity. A lot of times we focus on the first, inherent diversity. Inherent diversity are the things that we're born with. I'm black, he's gay, she was born in Ireland. Those are the things that we start out life's journey with. But there's another type of diversity. It's our acquired diversity. These are the skills, the attributes, the things that we gain as we go through the world, as we meet more people, as we learn new things. And it's actually the acquired diversity. That's what we mean when we say we want to hire the best people. But there's something really interesting about these two types of diversity. They actually work together. There's a researcher at Columbia by the name of Catherine Phillips. And Phillips' team has found that when people look different, they actually think different. So what that means is that our inherent diversity unlocks the power of the acquired diversity. And this actually has great effects on the businesses that we are trying to create. If we want to think about that idea of hiring the best person for the role, what we're really hiring people for are their unique skills and experiences, their acquired diversity. So inherent diversity unlocks the very thing that we say that we want to make our businesses successful. But there's another reason, and that's a personal reason. If we think about our inherent diversity, it's actually the sum of our experiences. And that's what makes us all unique. So what that tells us is if we have more inherent diversity, it actually allows us to be more ourselves. Is there anybody who doesn't want to be more themselves here? I'm going to take your silence as a yes. <laughs> diversity is actually the first step. We also need to think about what is the environment that we create. We need to be inclusive. Now, many of you have probably heard this term. We want our organizations to be more inclusive. You might even have used the term yourself, and that's an important first step. We need to be inclusive. But we actually need to go beyond that to make sure that people feel included. What do I mean by that? In my experience professionally, I find that a number of work social events actually end at a bar or a pub. Now, if we think about that, there are a lot of really good reasons for individuals not to want to be at the bar or the pub. There are health reasons, there are religious reasons, there are personal and family reasons. So we may be 
being inclusive by inviting everyone out for that drink, but there are a lot of folks that aren't feeling included. Another example, when I got to Dropbox, a woman in finance came to me and she said, I just want to share something that happened right before she went out uh, for our maternity leave. The guys on her team, they said, we know you're going out for maternity leave. We want to have a team bonding event before you go. She said, this is great, team bonding event. And they said, yeah, we've picked something really cool. We want to go play paintball. <laughs> and she said, I don't know if you've noticed, but I'm seven and a half months pregnant. I can't play paintball. And the guy said, no problem. We'll go play golf instead. So you can see, they were being inclusive, they extended the invitation, but she didn't feel included. So we need to be aware of how our cultural practices, who represents us on internally and externally, what events we choose for social events. All of those interactions actually convey who is actually feeling included. And again, if we want to unlock the power of acquired diversity, we need to push beyond being inclusive to making sure everyone feels included. Now, a model for how we do this comes from the world of accessibility. There's something called universal design. Anyone heard of universal design? Okay, I see a few hands. Universal design, it says that when we make things, we should make them for everyone. If we can make things better for people with disabilities, we actually end up making things better for all of us. So I have an image here of the Google self-driving car. Engineers thought this was the coolest thing, a self-driving car, and it is really cool. But as word got out that they were going to be building a self-driving car, the engineers heard from people in the blind and visually impaired community. And they said, what is cool for you is life-changing for us. So make sure that the interface that you use is actually accessible. Now, that's one way to think about universal design. It can inform the way we make things. It can inform the way we design programs. But we can also think about universal design should be informing the way we behave in our organizations. We should think about, are we always behaving in a way that makes people feel included? Now, something else about all the things that I've told you, this is not rocket science. Lots of people know this, smart people, people who solve problems for a living, people who build things, people who care. So why haven't we solved it? Well, there are a lot of barriers. And one term that you may have heard is unconscious bias. A lot of tech companies have rolled out unconscious bias training. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, but before we do that, I actually want to talk about why we might have some unconscious biases. So I'm going to invite you to join me on a journey, a thought exercise, if you will. I want you to imagine that you are a proto-human evolving on the African savanna. But unlike all the other proto-humans, you are incredibly progressive. So you've decided to slow down and be methodical about the decisions that you make. You look out across the horizon and you see that there is an animal approaching. It is moving quite quickly. It has four legs. It is smaller than a rhino. It is bigger than a hyena. And before you get much further, you are well on your way to looking like dinner. So our unconscious biases evolve to help us navigate a dangerous world. If you think about all of the animals that were evolving when we were evolving, we were not the biggest, we were not the strongest, we did not have the longest claws or the sharpest teeth, but we did have these big brains, and we could band together with groups of people who are like us to be successful. Flash forward, and we live in a world that is arguably more complex, and the decisions that we make need to be different. But we're still left with these unconscious biases. And I have a simple definition here. Our unconscious biases are blind spots that are, that are created because of errors in the way that we process data. And the reason why I use this definition is because our unconscious biases are both positive and negative. 
we can have positive feelings for people that are like us, negative feelings for people that are different, and they influence our decisions. But if it's a processing error, we can debug it, we can fix it. Now, I just want to give you a few examples of how unconscious bias actually plays out in the types of decisions we're called on to make every day. I'm going to show you an example from a resume study. And resume studies have been done in many geographies uh, and across multiple parameters. This particular study was conducted in Sweden in 2013. They sent out 5,500 resumes uh, with uh, randomly generated characteristics, and they would either have an Arabic name or a Swedish name. And they found that the Swedish names got 50% more callbacks. A lot of times, when we see a resume and we see something about it that tells us that that person is like us, we develop a kind of good feeling. How many of you have had the experience of getting a resume and you have something in common with them on the resume? Like, for example, they went to the same college that you did. How many of you have had that experience? All right, it looks like the majority of the audience raised their hand. Well, I know when I have that experience, I get these warm fuzzies and I start thinking about all the things we're going to have in common, what a great interview this is going to be, and I have to actually remind myself that I didn't like everybody that I went to college with. <laughs> so we've got to be consistently thinking about checking our biases. And it's not just in hiring, sometimes it's in the way we represent ourselves to the world. Now, Google has a home page where they sometimes change the doodle. And in 2013, an organization called Spark looked at those Google data doodles. And if they looked at the global doodles, there were 89 and only 77, oh, sorry, all 77 of them were of men. So that's less than 17%. So that's about 17% female. When Google was alerted to this, the good news is that they made efforts to change that. And now if you look at the, do the doodles and you track them, they're about 50% female. They've also got significantly more global representation, more ethnic diversity. And the way that they did this was that they widened the funnel. And when the doodles first came out, they focused on a very narrow definition of merit. The idea that these were individuals that had, had contributed to the field of hard sciences. Now they say individuals who have contributed to human endeavors more broadly. And, and suddenly they found that there were more women, there were more people of color, there were more global representation, representation they can find. And that's really indicative for us. We need to broaden the funnel. Um, when we think about what tech looks like, probably it looks a lot like this picture. Anybody seen Silicon Valley? Yeah, it's pretty funny. Um, and it's really hard to parody an industry that seems like a parody of itself. Um, <laughs> And I show this not to highlight the diversity issue in tech, but to emphasize that, that the diversity issue we see in tech, it's a diversity issue in Hollywood. It's a diversity issue in pub publishing. It's a diversity issue in a lot of different areas. And in fact, in Hollywood, if we looked at the top grossing films of 2014, only 2% were directed by women. And Hollywood matters a lot. Because girls tell us if they don't see themselves represented as computer scientists, then they don't think that they can be computer scientists. And in Hollywood, they have this great opportunity. They can paint a vision of, of society that is what we aspire to be, not just what we are. We face some different types of challenges when we think about what happens in the tech industry. So if we looked at venture capital funding, uh, we see that about 92% of the partners in VC firms are male. Um, and uh, they're 78% white um, and very little representation for blacks and Hispanics. So we have US data. It's similar if we were to look at the top global firms. And what this means is that VCs pattern match. Right? One of the things that happens is we have preferences for people who are like us. So here you see the founders of Dropbox, Drew Houston and Arash Fedowski, who look like a lot of the people that get funded, white, male, elite schools. And when, we, when they founded Dropbox, they wanted to create the best company for everyone, but they went to their networks. And if you fast forward, 
a number of years, Dropbox begins to get press that looks like this. So we've got to think about how do we think differently. So I want to share a, a story and a different example from another industry about how we can think differently about diversity. It's actually from high fashion accessories, which you might be surprised is something that I care a lot about. Uh, and in 2013, Christian Louboutin launched the Nudes Collection. Prior to that, they had always had a nude shoe, but it was in a shade of light beige. Louboutin had a person on his team who said, beige is not the color of my legs. And in that moment, he realized that, beige was a that nude was a concept, not a color. And this is a business opportunity. If you doubt how popular these shoes are, when I got my pair, I actually flew from San Francisco to London because they were sold out in the US. And I am not the only person I know who did this. <laughs> Another idea that we need to change a concept on is what is the culture contribution that people can give? Right? It was when Louboutin had someone on his team who asked a different question that suddenly they had an opportunity in a market they hadn't had before. And a lot of times we talk in our companies about how we want to hire for culture fit, but we really should, thinking, should be thinking about what is the contribution someone can make? What is the unique set of skills, abilities, and experiences that someone brings? Because when we do that, that's how we unlock the power of diversity. And we're actually seeing this happen in an organization as conservative as the military. In December, the US decided that all combat roles would be open to women. And there is vociferous resistance, but the conversation is going to be about how women are going to contribute to the field of battle. And I actually can't wait to see what happens. When you change the conversation, you get a different perspective. Um, so suddenly for us at Dropbox, we started to see press like this. We started to focus on the concept of diversity, not just the numbers. And that's important to our customers, it's important to our employees, it's an important to our future employees. So I want to close where I started. Because if I think about that science fiction idea and that, that, that there were these writers who were envisioning the future, everybody in this room has the opportunity not to just imagine a future, but to build a future. And we're all here at Inspire Fest to both be inspired to build that future and to inspire one another to build a better future. And that's an honor and a great responsibility. And that's what inspires me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Roger Spetty from Inspire Fest. Then click on the link to get your hands on ultra early bird tickets for Inspire Fest 2017 and make sure you're in the audience for this exciting international event.